My name is George Galloway, presenter of Kale Mahorra on Al Mayadeen Television. Well, thank you. I don't mince my words. I speak Kale Mahorra, and my audience does too. Kale Mahorra, free word, free for me, free for you. Catch it. Nice to meet you, brother. Welcome to Kalimahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, coming from London, but talking about Afghanistan in particular, seeking to learn some lessons from the long nightmare of 20 years of NATO occupation of that country, which ended so ignominiously with the American armed forces stealing in the middle of the night out of the country like a thief in the night. Redolent of the collapse of American power in Southeast Asia, in Saigon, in 1975, at least for people of my age. The story of Afghanistan, of course, is longer than 20 years. I myself warned Margaret Thatcher, the then Prime Minister of Britain in the 1980s, that her actions had, and I quote myself, opened the gates for the barbarians and a long dark night will now descend upon the people of Afghanistan. I never said a truer word, actually. A long nightmare led to the catastrophe that we have all witnessed, a humanitarian catastrophe, a civil rights catastrophe, a disaster for women catastrophe, and of course the total degradation of the standard of life of a people who were already amongst the very poorest in the world, with virtually no public services, virtually no infrastructure of any kind. So uh, the long occupation came to an ignominious end, but the implications of it, even for the occupiers, have not gone away. If you speak to a homeless person on the streets of Britain, for example, there's a very high chance that the person now living rough on the streets will once upon a time have been a part of Britain's occupation army in Afghanistan. If you speak to people who are in the mental health system, people who are living in real poverty in Britain, that shows that it's not just the thousands of NATO service personnel who gave their lives, but also those who gave their health, including their mental health in the NATO occupation. A disaster all round, but of course, far, far bigger a disaster for the poor Afghans who endured effectively 40 years of unbroken war, a kind of medieval length of war, uh, rather than a part of what you might have imagined in the modern era. Not that it taught the Americans a lesson. They were no sooner out of Afghanistan, but they were into Ukraine and threatening to go into China also. So it seems defeat doesn't always chasten empires. Perhaps it will have to be a final defeat that uh, brings the long period of Western empire to a close. As always, I'm just the enthusiastic amateur here. I'm joined by a group of distinguished experts, and let me introduce them to you now. Dr. Imran Ali Panjwani is the head of Diverse Legal Consulting in the UK and a senior lecturer in law at Anglia Ruskin University. Uh, Dr. Panjwani, uh, let's start with the humanitarian cost of all this. What was the net effect of 20 years of NATO expenditure of a trillion dollars and more uh, on the people of Afghanistan? One imagines with that level of spend, they must have been rather prosperous by the end, were they? <laughs> Not at all. Uh, thank you, first of all, for inviting me. Um, the net effect is that about 70,000 
Afghan civil civilians have died. That's one. Two is that 92% of the population is suffering from food deprivation. And according to the Watson Institute of Boston University, they said that people are living on a dollar and 90 cents a day. Um, so that's the, that's the net effect on the Afghan civilians, not to mention the uh, degradation of men their mental health and mental well-being. And that's apart from the troops that have died and uh, have been injured. So about two and a half thousand U.S. troops and about 20,000 uh, U.S. troops being injured. So the net effect isn't anything positive. In fact, it's a it's a destructive effect. Some people gained, though, the uh, military industrial complex in the West gained a lot, although they left most of the weapons mm -hmm. behind them because they were in such a hurry to run away. And now the Russians are using some of that weaponry mm -hmm. against um, uh, other American weaponry in the hands of uh, Ukrainians. Uh, but uh, not only Western arms companies, some of the political class in Afghanistan made off with quite a bundle. Mm -hmm. Yes, I mean, that's, that's natural in, in war. People can exploit, whether it is oil, whether it's position, whether it's um, having private contracts and private relationships with the government so, or the government that has come, come into the country. And I think that's a natural effect. But in terms of your question, the overall net effect is something positive on the country or something positive on the population I think that would be in the negative. But yes, as, as, you, as you know well know, that over centuries, there'll always be a few people that will benefit from war, yes. What about the uh, question of women? Uh, mm -hmm. They undoubtedly uh, made a return to the workplace. Mm -hmm. I mean, once upon a time before uh, the late 1980s, mm -hmm. uh, women were everywhere. I've been there and mm -hmm. talked to women professors and journalists and broadcasters and so on. Mm -hmm. I knew Afghanistan in former times. Mm -hmm. uh, they made something of a return to public life mm -hmm. uh, before the return of the Taliban to power. Didn't they gain anything lasting? Um, they would gain the freedoms that the state or the way the state was run at that time afforded them. Has it lasted now? Currently, no, because the Taliban are back in the power. And I would say that women's rights is like a, is like a, a toy or a, a chess piece used to justify a greater action. So I think that looking at that, it's a kind of short term game. But what's what's the long term policy and strategy? And are we are we saying that is a huge positive that perhaps outweighs other things? I'm not so sure. That's, that's the way I would look at the way the uh, policy operates. Dr. Saida Ani Wakar is an academic and consultant as well as being an artist. And she's from the Department of Politics and International Relations at the University of Westminster. Welcome back, doctor. Uh, what would you say are the main lessons to be learned from the failed occupation of Afghanistan? There's a very long history with regards to Afghanistan. And um, firstly, I believe that, you know, when, you know, NATO and US joined forces together, this was for counterinsurgency. So there you have always certain tenants when you go into a country which is failing. Um, the three tenants are you hold, you, you clear, you hold, and then you build. And unfortunately, um, the NATO forces, as well as the, um, you know, US has failed in a lot of ways there. They're able to clear, but they haven't been able to hold. And in terms of building, unfortunately, it always there's always a relationship between military and civilian. And that relationship has been affected massively, especially with regards to the civilian, you know, on the ground. Because once you have cleared an area, you know, which is deemed to be quite insecure, or where you think that, you know, uh, insurgencies might t take place again, um, again and again, you're there, but then you're not able to hold and not able to protect that area, not secure that area. And that was the biggest, I think, defeat that I say uh, has been in terms of looking at how they have actually been trying to rebuild. So once you have left that place, just cleared it, and, and you are forcing, you know, the contractors, the civilian contractors to build, to build something, to, to bring schools, you know, um, to have a sort of a infrastructure. Um, they themselves are afraid because they're not very sure whether that place is secure or not. 
So I, I believe that that's where the tenants, the three ma ma main tenants, they have failed completely. And also, um, I was just reading the other day about how, um, you, know, uh, you know, I'm sure everybody has seen, you know, on the television when uh, the troops were leaving, how the locals were hanging on to the C-19 flights. I mean, those images were horrific. You know, um, they were left with this um, idea that, that there's now nothing left. You know, they were hopeless because they knew that these guys are now leaving and we have nothing left. Um, and I think that is where they have massively failed because they were not able to secure it, not able to rebuild. In fact, they just left it in the most horrendous state. So I think there's a lot of lessons to be learned from that because from the very beginning, I think the plan had actually not been implemented properly. Isn't it the case, uh, Akib Mahmoud, a political activist, uh, twice a candidate for the London Assembly, isn't it the case that no one, not even Alexander the Great, has managed to clear and hold Afghanistan? No one can successfully occupy Afghanistan. Can Absolutely, they? George. Um, the thing that you have to remember is that the people of Afghanistan, um, they value their freedom above all else. Now, whether that takes shape in the form of uh, Mujahideen in the 80s or whether that was the Taliban or whether if we go back into history when the British invaded in the 1800s, um, they fought fierce wars um, down to the last man, down to the last bullet, uh, just to maintain their freedom. And it's the oldest nation in Asia, um, um, nation state in Asia, and, and they have maintained their freedom to this day. And they've seen off, as you said, uh, superpowers, whether it's from Alexander the Great all the way up to the United States and the Soviet Union um, in between that. So they do um, uh, maintain their freedom at, at almost every cost. The other thing that we have to remember is, and following on from um, doc the doctor's point, that the plan Nobody actually knew what the plan was going in. They went in with a strategic plan that we will bomb these people out of existence and we will stay there for the next 100 years and we will control the region because Afghanistan is the heart of Asia. If there is peace in Afghanistan or if you control Afghanistan, you control Asia. If there is instability in Afghanistan, the whole of Asia is unstable. And that is what they wanted. They got the second best prize, which was to make it unstable and left. And that's what they've, that's what they've left um, Afghanistan with. They destabilized Pakistan apart from anywhere else, didn't they? It's not just Pakistan, because as I said, the entire region depends on a stable Afghanistan. If, you know, if you look at um, China and its interests in Afghanistan, if you look at Russia and, and, and the route that it needs to get to the warm waters of the Arabian Sea and the Persian Gulf, that all depends on a stable Afghanistan. And so the reason why the Americans left in such a hurry and why they allowed the Taliban to take over in such a way um, in 2020, uh, was it 2020, was that they wanted to get the second best prize, which was if we can't have it, no one can. And so we'll just leave it as a no man's land, which is unstable. It's going to be, you know, a place of intrigue and, and it's full of spies. And, you know, all of these different countries are using their own machinations to achieve their own ends. And it's a complete mess. Let's hear from uh, Professor Paul Moorcraft, nowadays in Wales, but when I first knew him, he was an official at the UK Ministry of Defence. Professor, welcome to the show. Well, it's nice, nice to talk to you, George. Dr. Paul, with your extensive experience of war zones and conflict, uh, what do you think are the main lessons we should draw from the failed 20-year NATO occupation of Afghanistan? Uh, the simplest thing, which I know you'll agree with, George, is that uh, the more the West intervenes, the more problems they cause. Ever since the end of the, uh, of the first Cold War, 1991, every single Western intervention, whether it's Afghanistan, Iraq, Libya, whatever, has caused lots of problems. So that is one of the obvious measures, because you could argue that the West intervened in Russia. It was the, all the young experts, uh, American experts, going into Russia after 1991 and telling the Russians how to run their economy, which was very humbling for a proud nation. So all the Western interventions, nearly always, there's one or two examples in Sierra Leone, but mostly it's been disastrous. In Afghanistan, uh, it has been totally counterproductive uh, 
the nation is the state is much worse than it was before, uh, despite 20 years of nation building. So it's counterproductive. And maybe it's arrogant to assume that the West can build nations. Could the Americans and their allies have achieved anything in Afghanistan? Well, initially, they, they did control al-Qaeda. Now, despite what's said in the bazaars, most of the bazaars in the Middle East, personally, I don't doubt that uh, uh, Osama bin Laden's organization had a great deal to do with 9-11. Uh, and they were driven out of Afghanistan. Um, but was it necessary to control the whole country for so long? Well, no. No, because most of the fighters uh, in Afghanistan were simple nationalists. They were the same people who had been fighting, inverted commas, on the American side against the Russians in the 80s, which I experienced. So... Uh, the, but there was, there was some development. Of course there was. Women's education, which the Taliban is frankly reversed. Education, schools, hospitals. There was some development, despite the tremendous corruption. So the West did try to modernize the state. But it's pointless if, it's, if, if the people within that state don't want to have that kind of modernization. Well, it was evident from more or less the beginning that President Bush wasn't up to the successful occupation of Afghanistan, but several other presidents came and went and continued the same policy. Why did they all fail? To understand Afghanistan, you have to understand the history, you have to understand the clans, the various groups, the various religions. It is a complicated country, and it is not a Western country. It's entirely different culturally. And that is one reason why you simply can't graft uh, a modern economy onto a traditional one. And there was a lot of eagerness, I think, particularly in the cities, to develop and to adopt education and modern system. And the, the lots of newspapers, lots of television, lots of radio. In the countryside, very little had changed. And that's where the strength of the Taliban, the resistance to the Americans, what it were so uh, it was it, it didn't work but i think there were some genuine intentions the idea of naked imperialism is just uh, it's just not right people were trying to do some good not just the soldiers but civil societies ngos they were trying and now look at now look at the country people are starving if it's obvious that the occupiers did not really understand afghanistan it's obvious that this has been repeated over and over again since. Repeated in Iraq, repeated in Libya, they attempted to repeat it in Syria. Why don't these people learn the lessons of these societies that they invade, occupy, and then have to run away from? Well, there was, it's like saying imperialism, there was a, a religious element to reform in Africa, to help people to educate and train. There's always been a idealistic element, I think, but mostly it's 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 simple, straightforward um, exploitation. And in a sense, uh, the Americans believe that they should expand their way of, their way of living, and people don't want that. It just doesn't work. And the more you try to enforce a foreign uh, ideology onto a traditional society, particularly one which is very strongly uh, Islamist or Islamic, it, it is a waste of time. But there are an awful lot of urban people in, in Afghanistan who are sorry that the Americans have gone. It's, you can't just say it was all bad. There were some attempts to improve society, but there was too much corruption. Uh, that was one of the big issues, a bit like Pakistan. There's so much corruption, it's difficult to reform. So shall I infer from your answer that these mistakes may well be made again elsewhere? Despite the trillion dollar spend, if you include the American budget and the budgets of the other NATO countries, uh, the thousands of NATO personnel that were either killed or maimed or had their minds gravely affected, uh, that 
notwithstanding all of that, no real lesson will be learned. It will be repeated somewhere else. Are you talking about Ukraine, do you think? Uh, are you implying that there will be formal intervention? Because I believe that's already NATO is not just a proxy war. There's an actual war now between NATO and, and the Kremlin. Uh, okay, uh, formally, there are no American or NATO troops inside Ukraine. But the amount of equipment that's being poured in, yes, we have another intervention. Although it is part of Europe, it is part of the NATO area, whereas NATO went so-called out of area to fight in Afghanistan. Uh, it, how often can you keep on making the same mistake? Uh, I don't know the answer to that. People should stop intervening. The West should stop intervening, particularly in Islamic countries, unless they're invited in because of a natural uh, disaster, as in Turkey or in Syria now. So it was it was a mistake, uh, and and the result has been disaster. But whether the Americans and the West have learned, I don't know. Maybe Ukraine will change it all. Very candid, wasn't he, for a former Ministry of Defence uh, official? Uh, but there's a there's an Orientalism which tinges these kind of perspectives. Uh, he's a very nice man, so I didn't, don't mean to insult him, but it's almost as if they're saying the Afghans don't want modern things. They don't want freedom as we know it. But that's actually not true. I myself have walked amongst them when they were practicing. Uh, modernity. Uh, it's it's uh, Western policy that has created the conditions that they now like to ascribe to the backwardness of the Afghans. Uh, very true, George. Um, rather conveniently, he failed to acknowledge the fact that the Mujahideen and the Taliban and, and the jihadist mentality was actually written up in the West. Yeah. The, the entire curriculum was created in Germany and, and in NATO countries and passed over into the madrasas and seminaries of Pakistan, which were bordering the Afghan, uh, Afghan border in, uh, in the 80s. And that's where these people were created, this, this mentality and this jihadist mindset that, that he's talking about, where, where the countryside is, is backward and underdeveloped, and they don't want to, uh, you know, there's some kind of Luddites who, who don't want to, um, you know, have, have the modern conveniences or freedoms that you get. The Dr. Uh, Saida, isn't that uh, correct, what Akib says? that uh, The problem with talking about plans and so on, you see, I, I used to hear this about Iraq. It was Paul Bremer's fault. He didn't have a plan. He, mm. These things are inherently flawed, aren't they? That for uh, countries from thousands of miles away to invade and occupy someone is inherently doomed, isn't it? I mean, he very rightly kind of said that Afghanistan is a very complicated country, but you've got to understand the history of Afghanistan. I mean, you know, back in the days in the 60s, 50s, Afghanistan was, like you said, it was epitome of modernity. People all over from South Asia used to go watch films, theatres, um, you know, go and listen to traditional music, dancing in Afghanistan, all the way from India and Pakistan. So, I mean, I, I do believe that there is always this inherent problem, you know, with understanding, have this orient, you know, view. Um, and as you rightly, you know, uh, suggested, uh, one of the panelists, that um, when you have Mujahideen who have been backed by the US to fight against the Soviet Union invasion, now how do you go about that? I mean, history has been written. So who were those people who were backed up by um, uh, these Mujahideens to actually, um, you know, fight against the Soviets? Well, I used to say in Parliament regularly, you've punished the Afghan people twice. You, f you punished them first by bringing these people to power, and now you're punishing them because these people are in power. There's much more to say. We'll be right back after the break. Stay tuned.
You're watching Callum Ahora with me, George Galloway, in London for Al Maidin Television, talking about Afghanistan. Now, I first met my next guest more than 40 years ago when he was the chief foreign correspondent for the Guardian newspaper, when that was something to be. Nowadays, not quite so much. He's an author of tons of books, the latest of which is Ghosts of Afghanistan. He is Jonathan Steele. Jonathan, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure. Uh, Jonathan, in your book, you make it clear that this was another of the Bush and Blair wars, but plenty of presidents and prime ministers continued the war and occupation. Afterwards, who should share the blame for this disaster? Well, I think the failure was at the very beginning when they decided to topple the Taliban, which was not necessary if they were going after al-Qaeda. Because Osama bin Laden, although he had been a guest of the Taliban, when the after the 9-11 atrocities in New York and Washington, he left Kandahar and went into the mountainous area where he was beyond the control of the Taliban. And the Taliban had no previous knowledge of the 9-11 planning. It, it, it was a surprise to them, just as it was to everybody else in the world. So the mistake was to go in and topple the Taliban. They should have just mounted some kind of police action to find Osama bin Laden and deal with al-Qaeda without overthrowing the regime of uh, the country of Afghanistan, which was at that time the Taliban. You make the point, few could dispute it, that it was a fundamental mistake to attack the Taliban rather than hunt down al-Qaeda. But what about the subsequent period of, uh, of occupation? Who, who takes the blame for that? Well, they were embarked on a plan which was to try and build up Afghan military forces and to develop the country economically. But there was massive corruption and the economic programs that they put through uh, didn't work very strongly outside the main cities of uh, Mazar-e Sharif and uh, Kabul and Kandahar. So uh, most Afghans got, got no benefit from it. And the tactics of the US forces particularly, which was the dominant group in the NATO contingent, were often quite brutal. Um, they were using night raids where they would go into villages and surround compounds storm in and uh, embarrass the people who are often unrelated to the Taliban. So they created their own enemies by their bad tactics, military tactics. They were going into houses where there were ladies and the, it was a violation, obviously, of people's private uh, areas of their houses and land. And uh, with foreign troops coming in, it was considered criminal by the Afghan people, and they didn't welcome the U US and NATO forces. It's pretty obvious that incoming administrations, whether in Washington or London, were aware that the policy wasn't working. Why didn't they change it? Why did no one, no incoming administration, who must all have known that the policy was failing, why didn't they change it? Why did they keep on doubling down? Well, they, they wanted to withdraw at various points, but they could never be clear that the Afghan military forces would be able to fill the vacuum when the foreign forces left. So every time they came up with a plan to leave by the end of a particular year or the year after that, uh, they said, well, we're not really ready because the Afghan forces aren't in a position to take control. So th 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 that meant that there was never any kind of deadline. So ultimately, the Doha Agreement of 2020, which uh, laid down the conditions for withdrawal, was just an open-ended commitment by the US to leave and NATO to leave without any real guarantees from the other side that the Taliban would cease fighting. It's a hypothetical question, of course, but wouldn't it have been better uh, to deal with the al-Qaeda issue, leave the Taliban in power, than to effectively uh, 
hand them back the keys to Afghanistan 20 years later with all the damage that had been done in between. Well, it's hard to make a comparison because it's hypothetical, but I think that was the basic equation that at least when the Americans left, there would be peace at last instead of 35, 40 years of civil war. So that would be a great benefit. The foreign troops would leave, there would be no more fighting, and uh, that has pretty much happened. The Taliban are in almost 98% control of the country. There are one or two pockets where they don't control it, but basically they control the whole country. And uh, But the, the, the civil society has been squashed, and human rights for women particularly have been squashed. President Bush said he wanted to introduce a modern democracy in the United States, I mean, in Afghanistan. Uh, of course, he failed. He didn't know how to do that. How could he? There's not really a modern democracy in his own country. But that seems to imply that this kind of nation building, exporting Western ideas of democracy will be repeated, will be uh, carried out again and again in one place or another. Well, you cannot bring democracy through the barrel of a gun. Uh, that is the main lesson. The, you can't just fight your way to bringing a democratic society if there has not been one before. But if it's a country like Afghanistan that's never had democracy, you can't rebuild it when there's peace because there's no tradition of democracy, there's no understanding of what it means. There's no acceptance of compromise and uh, give and take in a political arena. So that is the problem. You can't bring democracy at the barrel of a gun. Dr. Imran Ali, let me put another lesson that should be learned to you. I know that in your legal field, you've come across this. A whole section, we could call them a comprador, uh, of Afghan society attached themselves to the occupation as interpreters, as soldiers, police officers, and so on. And some of them were left hanging on to the wheels of the American aircraft as they left. Many, many thousands of them uh, are not welcome uh, in the countries that they served and uh, are regarded as collaborators by uh, the people in their own uh, society. Isn't one of the lessons, don't trust the empire to look after you when things go uh, upside down? Yes, exactly. Um, and in fact, in 2021, uh, along with some other community centers, uh, we were dealing with the Afghanistan evacuation crisis. And exactly this problem reared its ugly head. And interpreters, contractors, they were trying to escape Afghanistan. We were actually, I was, we were writing to MPs, members of parliament saying, look, um, can you please give them safe passage? And just to give you this sort of real life experience is I was writing letters on behalf of my consultancy and they would show the letters to the military guards in the airport. They were allowed to come in the airport and, and, and uh, enter the airport, but they were stopped at the last gate to enter the airplane. Why? Because there was a military database. I'm just giving the example of the United Kingdom. There was a military database of who could board the plane and who couldn't. So the, first of all, that's primary evidence for you th that there was already people selected based on a particular criteria, which, which we can go in later, of who would board the plane and not. And as a second piece of evidence, and I'll end because other people want to speak, is that, that we do have data whereby there was meant to be insurance money exactly to help the contractors and interpreters and such people. But that insurance money that was actually promised by the Americans to give to those people who were suffering or needed to get out of the country was actually pocketed. And I think the figure is almost 60 million pounds. Yes. Well, blow me down. How surprised am I? Uh, Dr. Annie, uh, again, we, we hear uh, from Jonathan Steele about the situation of women. Uh, but isn't it the case that First of all, women are part of the society. If the society is being crushed, then the fact that they can go out and work is only of marginal benefit. If their sons are being killed, if their houses are being stormed by the uh, occupation forces, it's not going to be heaven on earth for women. But secondly, uh, 
uh, wasn't this just an urban phenomenon? What, the congestion zone of downtown Kabul was a woman-friendly zone, but the rest of the country was not. That's absolutely correct. I think this is where the rebuilding of the state just went completely wrong because they were only focused on the major cities. And outside, um, you know, there was hardly any awareness, any school, even if there were in certain villages, uh, because there was a vacuum always left, you would always have some sort of insurgencies in those little villages somewhere. And the only thing that these coalition forces could do at that point, or the military could do, was just go in, try to clear the place, and then force the USAID and every other, you know, um, organization to sort of build as quickly as possible. Now, how is that possible? If you just leave a place, you think that it's clear, and then you leave, you are actually, again, you know, uh, bringing in this massive gap. Uh, and hence, unfortunately, I think the further you go out from these um, congest congested zones, as you say, you will find that there's no awareness, no education, nothing, especially for women. And, um, and that is, has been the basic major issue. Even the, the civil, civilian contractors who'd been contracted to help in interpretation, the women. In fact, I was in contact with this one particular woman who was an interpreter, interpreter and she could speak about five, six European languages. And she told me herself that how, you know, horrendous the situation was when they left. And she, wasn't, she was told that, you know, she'll be able to get some access somewhere in one of the European countries. And she wasn't. And she said that as soon as she moved out to her village outside, you know, they had nothing, no schools, nothing. There was no infrastructure whatsoever. So she had been living, you know, and they had been in a fool's this, paradise, in a really. fool's paradise completely. And as, as you must be aware of how, you know, there has been a bombing, suicide bombing in, in, a, in a school in um, Afghanistan where 85 young women, girls have been, you know, killed. So it's an appalling state where you actually have just created certain congested zones. You have not gone beyond and rebuilt and reconstructed and helped the, you know, the population that actually need that sort of awareness, unfortunately. Akib, what's wrong with these people? Uh, you know, in Saudi Arabia, uh, more than half of the students in Saudi Arabia are girls. Uh, in Iran, uh, girls and women are, are everywhere in the public sphere, particularly in education. What is it about the Taliban take on Islam that makes them so poisonously reactionary on these subjects? There's a, uh, there's, there's a, there's a tendency to uh, think of the Taliban as a monolith, which they're not. The Taliban is actually a mixture of disparate groups of, you know, gangsters and criminals and, you know, militant scholars and, uh, you know, uh, not peaceful, but um, dialogue orientated uh, politicians as well are included in there. And so, you know, the whole peace process to get to Doha and have that agreement for the US withdrawal, that was led by what you would describe as, for want of a better word, moderate, the moderates. Moderate Taliban. The moderate yes. Taliban. And they were the people who were in Doha and who were willing to talk to the Americans and get things done. And so, so for a while, they had the upper hand. But when the Americans left and the way that they left, and then they stopped all of the um, you know, funding for all of these projects. So it's not just a case of the Taliban don't want these women or these girls or these people to be educated. The fact is that the Americans have stopped all the funding as well, because all of these projects were fund funded by the West. So all of the dollars that were flowing in for all of this, all of the foreign exchange reserves were frozen as soon as the Taliban came into power. And that was also down to the fact that the Afghan government that was installed of the Ashraf Ghani government and the Afghan National Army that was built up by the Americans and the West over those 20 years, they didn't have the staying power, they did not have the capacity to hold off the Taliban. They, they assured the West that we will fight them. Time and again, the West and neighboring countries, Pakistan, Russia, China, all of them told them, look, you need to sit down with the Taliban and you need to come to an agreement. You need to come to a political agreement, a power sharing agreement, a national unity government of some kind, where all of these rights and this constitution that you talk about can be protected, bring them into the fold. And they were adamant that, no, we will crush them. We have 300,000 troops. We have the latest weaponry from America. We have, the we have the best training. We've been trained for 20 years, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what happened? They collapsed like a house of cards. Mm. 
Now the Americans saw this and decided to, you know, uh, throw more fuel on the fire and froze their assets. In which allowed the hardliners to come back and say, well, we're going to do this, this, this and this, more and more extremist measures until the, um, uh, to punish the Americans by punishing themselves. I know it sounds rather retrograde, but that's exactly what's happening there. So they are trying to get, the, the moderates are trying to get international acknowledgement, trying to get some kind of aid, trying to get some kind of money into the country to fund these programs. The hardliners are saying no, the international community has abandoned us, Pakistan has abandoned us, you know, all of these neighboring countries have abandoned us and we're going to do it our way and we're going to, you know, ban these girls and we're going to ban education and we're going to, you know, get rid of every sign that the occupation was here. And these are signs that the occupation was there because as everyone has acknowledged that these were things that were built under the American occupation. And so that's the reaction that's coming from there. And the more America punishes them, the more the hardliners gain in strength and the more the moderates in the Taliban that, that exist, they, they're finding harder to, to, have, to have a voice. Doctor, what's the future for Afghanistan? It hasn't, uh, uh, the people are hungry. Uh, they've had a bitterly cold winter. As Aqib says, their uh, own sovereign wealth, such as it was, has been stolen and frozen and will likely never be returned. But at the same time, the instability that Aqib thought the US might have settled for, that second prize, that hasn't really happened either because the Afghans uh, have been surprisingly adept at uh, making quite decent relations with their old Russian foe, for example, with China and even with Iran, religiously speaking, the very antithesis of their mindset. Which way is it going to break, do you think? Well, I think that you have to allow a state to go through its complexities and emerge better. I mean, only in the what, 19th century here, Oxford and Cambridge refused to give degrees to women and Unitarians. So when we, I mean, in both of the scholars' comments, said the two professors, as I said, there's, a, there's that tinge of, as you said, Orientalism, this, this way of looking at the world that Afghanistan is so complex and United Kingdom, for example, is not complex. I mean, you only have to see what we're suffering here with the protests. <laughs> so I, I think, sadly, sadly, now we're in this state. Uh, as Jonathan Steele said, it would have been better had, we, had US and UK not gone in to such a degree in, two, in the 2001, for example. But now we're in this state, you have to allow the complexities to play out. And the only thing I feel we can, pr we can pray for is we don't want further loss of life you know, I think that this, this idea of women's rights is an important thing. Of course, it's an important thing, but it's not as important as somebody not being able to feed themselves or, or somebody losing their life. So as long as there is safety uh, and this lack of conflict, at least that brings about some, some stability in which, as uh, Akib said, these kind of different elements can come into play. Um, Dr. Rani, that point about stability is a good one, isn't it? Because after the fall of Dr. Najibullah, uh, a period of utter anarchy and chaos took place. And ironically, the Taliban were supported by the people to establish their rule in the first place because they brought order. They ended the period of savage uh, anarchy. Are they capable of keeping that kind of order and stability now? Is the new Taliban uh, going to be adept at that? Um, I think what analysis suggests is the Taliban's are really very much, um, you know, heavily relying on their raw natural resources as such. Um, and at the same time, um, they are bringing out this modern, you know, outlook, going to Doha, you know, and telling, well, actually, we're not very much against uh, women's education. In fact, we're, you know, pretty much o open with that. We're not the hardliners we were. But at the same time, um, when, you know, Afghanistan was at that point uh, occupied by these um, uh, coalition forces, you know, even the civilians were quite wary of the fact that now that, you know, the Taliban voice has quite, quite, quite died down, they're not very annoying anymore. But in fact, these foreigners who are coming in and actually sort of like bringing in more chaos and corruption uh, are pretty much annoying. And hence, it left quite a lot of vacuum, you know, outside, you know, these cities where Taliban obviously started to grow back in being popular. 
But um, I do believe that we can't go back to the future, but we can only you know, see that whether, you know, these um, Western forces are willing to actually sit down and have a proper bilateral or, you know, multilateral talks with Taliban and get to a certain point where, you know, ideas or rebuilding state or how they are going to go about rebuilding that state. Akib, last word to you. Uh, are they going to achieve the kind of stability that certainly their neighbours want to see, uh, or will this kind of no war, no peace uh, situation that exists now between the West and Afghanistan lead to not just the growth uh, uh, or the strengthening of the hardliners in the Taliban, but even worse than the Taliban, the Al-Qaeda, ISIS mentality, might they begin to grow and then become a security threat not just to the people around Afghanistan, but as we found out in New York and elsewhere, a security threat to everyone. Absolutely, that's the greatest fear at the moment because uh, ultimately it's the West's responsibility. We went in there, we destroyed that country. We gave them the, um, you know, the idea that we're going to rebuild their nation and we're going to give them a constitutional democracy. And then we abandoned them to the Taliban. Uh, we took away all of their uh, financial resources as well at the same time. So it's quite rich for us to sit here and point fingers at the Taliban, you know, in the West, especially Western politicians, to say, oh, you know, they're against women's education and they're against this and they're against that. But the reality is we gave seats on planes to dogs, but we didn't give seats on planes to Afghans who helped, uh, uh, collaborated with, the, with the, our occupation. The reality is that we took away their money and, we, and we're refusing to talk to them now and engage with them in any meaningful way. That's, that's the reality and that's what, um, you know, all of the region has to come together and explain to the West that this is not okay and they need to come to the table with other countries in the region and help not the Taliban, but the people of Afghanistan. They need to offer them a solution to the problem that we have created. Powerful final words from political activist Akib Mahmoud. There's lots of lessons and we've only had time to uh, perhaps skate over many of them. For me, the number one lesson is this. The NATO countries don't even look after their own soldiers after the war. So they're not going to look after yours. They don't even care about the suffering millions of cold, hungry and increasingly unemployed people in their own countries. So how are they going to care about yours? The biggest lesson is that America is not to be trusted, that they are there not because they love you, not because they're your friends, but because of what you can do for them. And so I caution Everyone who regards themselves as being in the American camp, in America's corner, don't imagine that because you're in America's corner that America is necessarily going to remain in yours. When the going gets tough, the tough get going, but the Americans get off on their marks, on the plane, out, never to be seen again. Perhaps a lesson for some elements in some other countries, particularly in Ukraine. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kale Mahorra, and you have been a marvelous audience. Thanks for watching.